So our biases drive our decision making. Our worldview determines what we see as fact and what we see as fiction. Our opinions shape what we accept as truth. That is a long way of saying, of reiterating the fundamental lesson that Jeff and Song and so many others have talked about today. We have implicit bias. Implicit bias drives the way we see the world. It drives the way jurors see the world in addition to prosecutors and judges and everybody else. And if it drives the way that jurors see the world, then do we need to deal with race during voir dire? And I think we all know the answer, right? The answer is yes. Yes, not yes. Yes is Old Testament. I'm sorry I slipped in my Old Testament there. And, and hopefully, we will soon all muster the courage that Jeff just referred to uh, in, in discussing Kiana's work in Seattle. We all have that inside of us. All of us have that capacity. We just need to step up and do it. Person up, right? Person up, as I, as I tell my 21-year-old stepson. Just person up, and he does it. We can all do it. So do we need to deal with race during voir dire? Damn straight, right? Damn straight. We know that implicit bias motivates, often determines decisions at every level, so you must address it. As Sun Wolf, a great pioneer in communications and in public defense from Colorado said, jurors vote values, not facts. You better damn well know their values during jury selection and get the ones off who are not going to listen to you. We know that implicit bias is unconscious, so you just can't ask people about their implicit biases because they think they're fair. They don't think it's a bias. So you have to detect it. You can't leave it to them. Even if they were 100% honest about their biases, they couldn't tell you about it. You have to do the work of getting it. And we know that we cannot change deeply held beliefs during voir dire. So get the ones off who are the least able to control it. Right? You're not going to be able to educate them during voir dire. During the brief interactions that you have during voir dire, you are not going to be able to take somebody who has an implicit bias and educate them into getting rid of that bias or really into even controlling it. I think it's somewhat arrogant that we think we can do it. My family is originally from Argentina. Buenos Aires is one of the most psychoanalyzed countries in the world, um, just like New York, right? People go to psychoanalysts, why? Because they have some problem. They want to change it. They pay to change it. They go twice a week. They do it for years, and do they change? No. <laughs> right? So who am I to change somebody's views through a few simple questions during a voir dire process? I don't believe that I can do that. I don't believe anybody can do it. That's the, the bad news is we got to do all this work. The good news is we have, number one, the law on our side. Not going to spend any time on law. I included some materials that were updated yesterday by Gerald. They're in your materials, case citations that are going to help you. But the good news is the law gives us a foothold to talk about race during voir dire. That's number one piece of good news. The other two pieces of good news are it's really not that hard once you must are up the courage to do it. And all it takes is finding your inner Oprah being willing to talk to people in ways that are non-judgmental. That's number one. And number two is asking the right questions. If you ask the right questions and you listen to people, you are likely to uncover many of their biases. It's not going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. I know that I'm far from perfect. You know, I have the 1237 moment, AM moment, every day in trial when I wake up in the middle of the night whether it's 137 or 1237 or 232 or whatever it is, and realize the mistakes I made. You will make mistakes during trial. You will not be perfect during voir dire, but that's okay. This is a system, a deselection system, that helps you get as close as you can to discovering as many of the biases as you can. So this is not about perfection. Don't, don't, don't put that on yourself. Please don't put that on yourself. We're talking about finding your inner Oprah. Now, this is Oprah with Lance. Can you guys see that, or is it a little blurry? You can see it? Yeah. So look at Lance. He's got his hand on his heart. He thinks he's being persuasive and getting across to Oprah, doesn't he? Look at the look on his face, right? But we know that Oprah is really pulling out 
for our benefit who he really is, right? And that's what you're going to be doing during voir dire. You're not going to be judging these people. If you judge them, you're going to be silencing them. You're going to help them express something that they may know about themselves or they may not know about themselves in a way that you can use that information to strike them so they don't punish your African-American or Latino client or whomever during jury selection. That's the fundamental thing I want to get across today. And I am rushing a little bit because <laughs> we have very little time. So the first part of it is listening. You're going to have to learn to listen. I say learn to listen because I had to learn to listen. You know, I had to, learn, I had to learn to apply the listening techniques I had in other parts of my life in the courtroom. And the second part of it is you're going to have to learn to ask the right questions. Many of you probably already know how to do this, but we're going to talk about that. The first part, the listening part, is going to be covered a little bit more by my partner, Kiana Givens, who's going to talk very deeply about interactions with particular jurors. So you will see how she models and discusses the active, what I call active listening, she calls it deep listening, it's the same thing. So the first part of it is asking the right questions, and that's what I'm going to focus on. And the second part is how to listen actively or listen deeply and Kiana's going to, you're going to see a lot of that on the part of Kiana. So, so listening actively, use open-ended questions. So I'm going to go over a little quickly on the, I'm going to go over, over this part a little quickly. Use open-ended questions. Do not judge. Judgment equals silence. We're going to use gentle prods, little phrases like, tell me more, or uh-huh, or the simple repetition of the last four words a juror said. Things that encourage a juror to talk and encourage you to listen and to shut up, right? A good voir dire transcript looks exactly the opposite of a good cross transcript, right? Cross, you got a question, a yes. A cross, a yes, right? In voir dire, it's the opposite. Juror, blah, 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 blah. Lawyer, blah. Juror, blah, 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 right? That's what we want to see. More talking by the jurors is more information. More information means better strikes more cause challenges, and better per peremptory strikes. Physicalizing your interest, leaning in. I am so interested in you. You are the most important person in the world to me right now. The slight bend, you know, that's my mantra. I'm from San Francisco, so I have to have mantras, you know, right? Um, so the, the leaning in, the eye contact, you know, all of that. And you'll see Kiana talk about that during her presentation. The interaction with the juror. The easiest way is simply to say, tell me more. No complicated questions. Tell me more about that. What's going on in your mind is, you're fascinating to me. That answer was fascinating. Tell me more. Oh, wow, tell me more. That's all you need to do is give them an opportunity to talk. So that was the first part, just going back a little bit. The listening actively, we just covered that pretty quickly. We are now going to talk about the part that takes a little more preparation in terms of particular cases. And that is asking the right questions. How do you ask the right questions? When you do deselection, generally, in most cases, um, in all cases, you look at your theory of the case, and you're going to deselect for people who can't accept that theory of the case, or people who are most likely not to want to listen to you or your theory. When we talk about race, and in light of everything we talked about today, what Jeff and Song talked about in terms of implicit, implicit bias and the history of racism in the United States, we know we got to do it. So we want to figure out what are the right questions for deselecting people, identifying people who have the implicit biases that are going to get in the way of giving our clients a fair trial. People who have implicit racially biased views that they are unlikely to be able to control. So we have to find them. So how do we ask that? Generally, there are two types. Really, there are three listed here. Um, two in one category, one in the, in the second category. Skewed direct and indirect questions, biased questions, and skewed leaning questions. Let's forget about the word skewed for a second. Actually, let's, let's focus on the word skewed first. What I mean by skewed is this. There's a spectrum of views out there. Some people believe this, and some people believe it's opposite. Skewed questions are questions that are designed to look at one side of the spectrum and not the other. 
You skew the question so that you get people only with this side of the, of, of the spectrum raising their hands, right? So why would we want skewed questions? And, and we'll talk about some specific skewed questions in a second. Because if we're trying to discover people who have implicit biases, we don't want to spend time talking to people who have less implicit bias or even, in, or even are very aware of implicit bias and are going to be leaders for our clients in the jury box. We want to spend time talking to the people over here who are going to be a problem for us. So if we ask general unskewed questions that are just going to, the, the what do you think questions to anybody, then you're going to get people raising their hands over here and people raising their hands over here, and you're splitting your time between people who are probably good jurors and people who are probably bad jurors, and that means you have less time to talk to these people. Does that make sense? It's a matter of effective time management, which is really important because we don't have forever during voir dire. We just don't. Judges don't give it to us. Um, some, in federal courts, some, some people don't even get it. So we have to use the voir dire we, we, we have, the time we have, in the best way we can. So, so skewed questions are questions that are focused on the people who are likely to have the implicit biases that we want to strike. Direct and indirect, those are, are questions that are either directly about race or about something that is a stand-in for race. We'll get to this in a second. And then there are leaning questions that are about attitudes. So this is all a little bit abstract. Let's make it real. Okay, so skewed direct and indirect questions. Here's one way, a very abstract way to think about it. Lots of people think X. And there you insert the biased belief or the proxy for that belief. How many of you share this view? Right? Here's an example. A direct skewed question, directly about a racial attitude. What do you think about people who always accuse the police of being racist when they stop or investigate or arrest a black person? Do some of our jurors have that point of view? Yeah. You bet, right? That's a direct question about it. You ask that question. Now, that question is skewed because it makes an assumption and it asks about that assumption. So, the people who are going to answer this question are likely, not everybody, you're going to get some, some people on the other side of the spectrum who will raise their hands, but most people who want to comment about this question are over here in the strike zone. They're over here. Here's another example. Why do you think some defense lawyers always accuse the police of being racist when they stop, investigate, or arrest a black person? Right? Why do you think some defense lawyers always accuse the police of being racist? That is an attitude that some people have who have an implicit bias, right? And if you throw that question out there, are you going to get people answering that question in your jurisdiction? Absolutely. That question draws lots and lots of answers wherever I try cases and where colleagues of mine try, try cases. And once people start talking about that, you don't stop there with their yes answer or their first answer. You get into a tell me more kind of interaction and when they start talking about it, they have these Lance Armstrong moments where they are speaking the truth to you that they sincerely believe, and they believe that they're getting through to you, and you are seeing them, you are seeing their attitudes without judging them. You're, you're Oprah-ing in that moment. You're sitting back and doing what Oprah did in that slide, which is to look at the person sincerely, listening to them, not interrupting them, and wanting to hear more from them. You are operating in that moment. So if you come up with the right questions, and maybe these are the questions you might ask in, in a case that, by the way, has a police stop, a racially biased police stop. It might fit not only the race part of it, but it might also suit your theory of the case if ra a racist stop is part of your theory of the case. But you, you, don't, you can also, remember we, we, um, the formula is lots of people think X, and there you insert the view or the proxy. You don't have to have the, the, the view itself. You can put a stand in for that. Language, the race card, social phenomena like Black Lives Matter, neighborhoods, cultural markers. So for example, how many of you think that defense lawyers like me play the race card whenever we can? 
How many of you think that we play the race card to get our clients off? How many of you think we play the race card to get our guilty clients off? How many of you think that people who come to our country ought to learn English? That's language as a proxy for an anti-Latino bias. I use that a lot in my, gang, in my Latino gang cases. That, we can talk for hours with jurors about that. Because people who have that point of view seldom believe that that point of view is racist, right? And sometimes, you know what? It isn't. Sometimes somebody has that point of view because they want to see Latino immigrants succeed. And you will soon know that in your interaction with them because you're listening to them. But many people who believe that Latinos ought to learn English, they're going to start to talk to you about culture, changing our country, changing our ways. And those will be um, red flags for you that these are folks you need to talk to more, you might even get for cause, and you certainly should consider using a peremptory strike on. So proxies, stand-ins, concepts can do a lot of the work for you. How about this one? This is kind of fuzzy in the bottom. I don't know if you can read it. How many of you think that we have a big problem with illegal aliens and crime? With illegal aliens and crime. That is using the concept of illegal immigration as a proxy for racist points of view. All right, that one will get you lots and lots of discussion and many great strikes, many. Now, as you read that question, what are you thinking? You're thinking, I don't ever want to use the phrase illegal alien, right? That's going to stick in my craw, right? I mean, how many of, aren't you thinking that, yeah. right? I certainly think that. The reason you use it, and this comes from, again, from an Argentine reference. There's a, there's a psychologist in Argentina who's very well known named Jacques Lacan. He's the most confusing guy in the history of the world. But he's got these great phrases, and he says, speak with the ear of the other. If you want to get through to somebody, speak with the ear of the other. And so when you, if I say to a panel that includes potential anti-Latino racists, people with implicit biases, put it that way, because we're all racists, and I say, how many of you think that we have a problem with undocumented people and crime? Fewer people are going to raise their hand. They're not going to feel as safe. They're not going to feel as liberated. They're not going to feel as open. They are going to feel judged because I'm using a word that they associate with people who judge them. And so, Martin, if you're going to ask that question, what conversation do you have with your client before you do that? Absolutely. You will talk to your client. You do not want your client freaking out <laughs> during jury selection, <laughs> thinking that he has a white supremacist lawyer <laughs> who is now doing everything he can to get the client convicted. You have to walk them through this, obviously. And that is a matter of client-centered advocacy, which is very much um, being talked about today. I just call that good lawyering. Good lawyering is communicating with your client. But you need to have that conversation so that your client is not stressed out, not hurt, not offended, not reacting in ways that are distracting. So absolutely, thank you, Jeff, for, for pointing that out. So you want to speak with the ear of the other. If you speak with your values, if you speak with your language, you are sending a signal to everybody out there, to the people you want to talk to you. You're sending a signal to them not to raise their hands, because here we go again. Here's another liberal from San Francisco who's about to tell me that I don't know what is going on, right? And I, I can't wait to get out and text my buddies about what an asshole this defense lawyer was, right? So if I want that person to raise their hands and talk to me with the Lance Armstrong moment of putting his hand on his heart and saying, you know, we got a big problem with illegal aliens in this country. I'm not a racist, but I got to tell you, you know, we can't have these people coming in here, breaking the law, and then, and then you know, getting benefits and, and killing people. If I want that person to say that to me, I can't talk to them about undocumented people. I have to talk to them about illegal aliens. I know that doesn't feel good. That makes you have this moment, <laughs> right? But I will promise you this. I will promise you this, that you don't need to worry. Once you've had that conversation with your client, 
you don't need to worry about the people who are struck from the jury and walk out, who are struck and are not part of your jury. You need to worry about the 12 plus the two or four alternates or whatever you have. Those are the people who you need to worry about. And by the time you are in your opening statement, they will know who you are. They will know how you fight for your client, how committed you are. They will know your values. They will know that you stand for justice and equality and everything that is right, whether it's apple pie or flan or whatever it is. They will know that you are a good person with the right values. So even though it sticks in your craw and makes you want to regurgitate, to use that phrase, illegal alien or whatever it is, right? If it does, maybe it doesn't, but if it does, don't worry about that. That's a small price you have to pay for dealing with this issue on behalf of your client and maximizing the chances of somebody opening up. How am I doing? 10 minutes? Good. OK. All right. I'm rushing a little bit because I want to be very respectful. I, re I really want you to see what Kiana has done in, in, with her example of, uh, in, in Seattle. So I want to make sure I get done on time. Another kind of question, what we've talked about so far are the direct race questions. What do you think about you know, wh why? Uh, you know, here's another one that I didn't do, but it's a good one in terms of going back in terms of direct bias questions. About 13, 14% of our population is African American. Somewhere north of 30, 35% of our prison population is African American. How many of you think we got a problem with African Americans in crime? Right? That's a direct bias question. Pro and that's one type of question we talked about. Then we talked about stand ins or proxies. For and now we're going to talk about the leaning questions. Which way are you leaning? Some people think this, some people think this. Which way do you lean? So, again, we're going to start with, with the sort of neutral question that asks everything, and then we're going to narrow it. Some folks feel that over the past 10 years, Progress for the black community, I didn't say African American, for the black community has been moving at about the right pace. Others feel it's moving a little too fast. Others, a little too slow. Which are you a little closer to? The right pace, a little too fast, a little too slow. OK, that might be great. You might get a great conversation, a great dialogue going. It might be very interesting. But the people who say, hey, we're going too slow, African Americans deserve more. They are victimized in the, uh, in the criminal justice system. The those are, you're putting bullseyes on their backs for the prosecutors to strike them. And even if the prosecutors are not that good at jury selection, chances are they are going to know to put a bullseye on the back of these people, right? They're not going to be that dumb, right? They're just not going to be. And you can never underestimate your adversary. That's from Che Guevara, who, like Shakespeare, was from Argentina. <laughs> never <laughs> underestimate your adversary. So I would ask it this way. I would skew it. See? See how I learned how to, I'm learning how to do PowerPoint. Leaning questions, skewed leaning questions. So the way I would ask it instead would be, how many of you think the government has made this kind of progress a priority at the expense of other important issues, at the expense of other people, at the expense of other communities? Some way that says, you over here, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to you over here but in a way that's masked so these people don't feel disrespected. So it's natural that these people will raise their hands and you can have the tell me more kind of interactions with them that are going to help you identify the implicit bias uh, attitudes and also scale them, kind of measure them so you know, well, he's got an implicit bias attitude and she does too, but he's worse. Since I only have one peremptory left, he's gone. And by the way, I want to have a lot of time to do this, but please don't think that your jurors of color don't have strong implicit biases. Please don't think that. I asked Angela before today, what's the most important thing I can talk about here? And she said that, and I thank her for that. That was very useful for her to remind me, because you know what? I probably would have forgotten to do that, so thank you. Um, so I already I covered this one, right? OK. So what do I have, about five minutes? OK. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to. I'm gonna, just throw up some ideas. If you're thinking to yourself, you know, damn, how am I going to get into this stuff? How am I get I'm going to ask about race, and nobody's going to talk to me. They're going to be quiet. They're not going to say anything. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be embarrassing. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to throw this question out there. Think about all the racial issues that you can tap on, right? Tap into, rather, to get into a conversation. 
Hey, how many of you folks think that this man has done a disrespect to our flag? How many of you folks think that this man is putting his politics when he should be doing his job and not getting terrible statistics? By the way, he gets pretty good statistics. <laughs> but, but the people who say he shouldn't be hired, shouldn't, be, you know, shouldn't get any contracts, don't see that. They talk about his bad statistics. Not true, because their opinions drive their perception of facts. But how about Colin Kaepernick? I don't care if you're in San Francisco, Detroit, wherever you are, you're going to get jurors talking about what they think about that, right? Is it that hard to come up with a skewed question? This is a good proxy. Colin Kaepernick is a good proxy. The man is doing a lot, so I don't want to put more on his shoulders. You don't have to invite him to your courtroom. <laughs> but, but you can use his picture, you know? And, 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 and that's a great proxy. A great pro that's going to get you some discussion. How about this one? When you have a gang case, Portland police to halt purge all gang designations. So this is a good race bias. This is a good point of entry. You could fashion a great skewed question, great skewed proxy question about race and gangs based upon this notice, right? There are going to be some people out there who think, this is great. Communities of color have been devastated by over-labeling and over-association with gangs. You don't want to talk to those people. You don't want to put bullseyes on their backs. Don't do that. Talk to the people who think, you know what? How many folks think that political correctness has gone so far that our police can't even do their jobs? They can't even take, keep track of, of gang members, right? So if you're in Portland, and this is in the news, you can use that question. Are you going to get answers? I think so. I think so. How about shootings, right? How many people think that the, the police officer may have made a mistake? but he was just doing his job. And now, politically, the politically correct media have gone after him, right? You can come up with all sorts of great direct questions or proxy questions based upon what's in the news. And now I'm wrapping up. I got like two minutes? Three minutes. It's, it's a, an embarrassment of riches, right? And I started one minute late. I'm still going to bring it in under time. What do you think about that, huh? What's not to love? So what about diversity? Do we care? Yeah. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. You can't assume that, um, that jurors or potential jurors of color don't have implicit biases. Of course you can't assume that. But you still want a diverse jury. And by the way, you should be talking about this with your judges beforehand so, they're, so they're, they understand the law and they understand the importance of it. And they give you more leeway <laughs> in jury selection if you explain these things to them. The, the article that I included, um, and I think maybe somebody else included it, I'm, I'm sure that Kiana and I included in our materials from Mark Bennett talks about this, but diversity changes the conversation. This is from the study. This is a study that, that, that of jurors that were either six white or four white and two African American. That was, that was, those were the pools. And they found that diverse juries, the 4-2 combination, had greater, had longer deliberations, greater focus on actual evidence, greater discussion of missing evidence, fewer inaccurate statements, fewer uncorrected inaccurate statements, and greater discussion of race-related topics. And a free Ginsu knife, in addition to these information-based benefits, the, 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 the um, researcher found interesting pre-deliberation effects. Simply by knowing that they would be serving on diverse juries, as compared to the six all-white ones, white jurors were less likely to believe at the conclusion of evidence, but before deliberations, that the black defendant was guilty. So diversity does matter. It changes the conversation. So yeah, be careful. You can't make an assumption about a particular juror of color, but you want diverse juries. Let your judges know that and work hard to get that because it changes the nature of the deliberation. Right? And unless you've got Henry Fonda in there, you better be worried about it. So my last thing I want to say is, right? Can you guys see that? All right. I, I love dogs. I have a thing for huskies. Um, I love all dogs, really, but my current dog is a husky. They like the cold. They're very comfortable in the refrigerator. <laughs> this dog thinks that she is, um, a, look, looks great. I'm on top of the world. Here I am. But she looks ridiculous, and she's not accomplishing anything, right? Right? We have to get out of our 
sphere of comfort. We have to get out of our comfort zone. We have to take the power that we have through the law, through the Constitution, through our training, our preparation, the strength of our colleagues, the support we have from people, from our colleagues in Brazil, in Argentina, across the United States, our colleagues who understand that we're rolling that rock up the hill, that we're tilting at windmills. We have to take that strength and have the courage to conquer our fears and say, you know what? Once I step up, once I've got that question ready and I step up, all I got to do is listen. And if you conquer those fears, you are not going to be perfect. You're going to miss some jurors. You're going to miss some answers. You're not going to maybe have the, every question every time. But you are going to be able to get rid of many folks who get in your way. So thank you for listening.